we can start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, public uh, event of the Viper Lab project, which is dedicated to give the PV communities and particularly the ones that are interested in the pyroviscite uh, topic uh, and the general public also maximum information about the status of achievement uh, in the pyroviscite based PV field in Europe. Uh, I'm glad to see many of you uh, physically here, but also online where we have more than 80 registered uh, people online. Um, as you know, uh, pyroviscite solar cell have shown remarkable progress in very short time uh, from reported efficiency around 3% in 2009 to more than 32% uh, by the end of uh, 2022. Uh, and this topic is getting, is getting momentum in Europe. Um, and is now backed up by strong research and innovation communities and infrastructures that are organizing themselves uh, to establish a clear strategic research and innovation agenda uh, to support the introduction of pyroviscite based solar cells uh, to the market. Um, so the event um, uh, is divided in two main uh, sessions today. In the first session, we will have a presentation uh, from the Viper Lab partners regarding the Viper Lab project and achievements as with the emphasis on the market forecast and strategic research and innovation agenda. In the second part, we will have a panel uh, discussion to discuss how uh, to remove the remaining barriers for the production and commercialization of pyroviscite solar cells. Um, before starting the presentation, please allow me to introduce uh, myself. Uh, my name is Nader Akil. I'm the operation manager of the p &O office uh, uh, in Belgium, in Brussels area, and we are a partner in the Viper Lab project uh, for uh, supporting dissemination, communication, and exploitation. Uh, p &O is a consultancy company uh, active in all parts uh, related to the value chain, to the innovation management value chain. Uh, so this, uh, this is ranging from developing vision and roadmap for sectorial organization to the conceptualization and development of large collaborative project where we bring about 1 billion euros in terms of funding for our client every year and uh, in business analysis and um, go-to-market strategies. Um, I will be the moderator for the event today. So to keep the timing under control, I would like to ask you to keep your questions uh, to the end of the presentation sessions. Uh, so you will have uh, the opportunity to ask the presenters uh, uh, some questions before we uh, move to the panel discussion. Also, I would like to remind you that uh, the event will be recorded and some picture might be taken. So in case you have any objection, please let us know and then we will make sure uh, that you are not appearing in any dissemination material. Um, so let's start uh, with our first speaker, Dr. Natalia Matichuk. Uh, to present the Viper Lab project. Uh, Dr. Natalia uh, received her uh, PhD in chemistry and material technology from Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia in 2015, uh, where she studied cal calcogenide thin films for photovoltaic application in cadmium telluride and uh, castorite solar cells. And since 2017, uh, she's at the Helmholtz uh, Centrum Berlin focusing on CIGS absorber surface analysis and implementation of inorganic HTMs in pyroviscite CIGC uh, uh, tandem devices. And since 2021, uh, she's involved in the Viper Lab uh, project coordination and transnational access management. Uh, so she will be uh, presenting the Viper Lab project to you. Yeah. Oh, it's lost. Thanks a lot, uh, Nadia, for the introduction. Quite long. Um, yeah, I'm Natalia Matichuk. Um, I will try to shortly present um, what's this Viper Lab project about, what we do uh, for these uh, Horizon 2020 projects, and ah, should I do myself? Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, good. So this is, uh, as I said, I will quickly introduce. Uh, I, I won't be able to cover in 10 minutes everything that we do in the project. And um, for, uh, I mean, initially, I can start with the motivation of our project because it was always um, 
I like these slides even for myself to keep on reminding uh, these quite large consortia why we do things and where are, you, are we looking forward to and so on. So when we when the proposal was started, that was in 2020, there was um, the hype of the perovskite uh, technology and all this activity was very um, visible and getting um, high speed. And for example, with the small statistic that we see on the screen now in 2020, there were um, nine laboratories in the world that were having um, high efficiency reported for the perovskite um, silicon tandems, and five of them were in Europe. So that looked a very promising uh, research community for the perovskite uh, technology. But on the other hand, there were um, a strategy that would not would unite the these community efforts towards um, perovskite technology to reach the, the the market was missing. So what we and you will soon find out who we, what we thought of, why not to combine these high potential for the perovskite uh, technology and the missing strategy for this uh, and uh, unite efforts and to come up with an idea of a project that is called shortly Viper Lab. And it's actually standing for fully connected uh, virtual and physical perovskite uh, photovoltaics laboratories or labs. And who is we? So this is um, a, a pool of research institutes in Europe from many different countries that are all dealing with research um, of in the perovskite uh, field. And here I made a, a list of those partners in the consortia that are um, using physical infrastructure for these uh, uh, perovskite technology. Uh, some of the same partners also have so-called virtual infrastructures. And here are the NAR, CNR, HDB, and Ulish, specifically High Earn, that are having some virtual infrastructure for perovskite database or computing or simulation or even um, pilot line that can be um, operated virtually, uh, the case of Amanda in uh, High Earn. And <clears throat> We were thinking, why not to combine these two types of infrastructure for the perovskite? And so they are connected into on one access point and to make this infrastructure for the for the rest of the community so that we help the community to increase the efforts and to unite the, these efforts into into the into achieving the higher um, efficiency and um, knowledge for the perovskite. So after combining these two physical and virtual infrastructure with the, by teaming up with partners like Becquerel Institute and PNO who are experts for dissemination, communication and exploitation, we decided to, to come up with a plan of networking and joint research activities next to these sharing infrastructure. So here we are, the Viper Lab consortia uh, made of 15 partners from nine different countries, as you can see here. And here is the main goal written, as I was already saying, basically to ensure the, the united efforts into the achievement of higher efficiencies, but most of it, most important, um, better knowledge into how to help these perovskite technolo technology to reach the market. And the main way to do it was to, through facilitated and coordinated infrastructure um, uh, access, transnational and virtual infrastructure access. Um, to to be able to do to implement all our goals and plans, we got funding from Europe under the um, Horizon 2020 Infraia call, and this is our budget. We are now approaching the second year of the Viper Lab project, and there are one and a half uh, years more to go. Uh, and yeah, ACB is coordinating, and this is why I am giving now this presentation from ACB side. So, okay, yeah, um, in a nutshell, as I already covered it a bit, we have a very uh, high um, or 
the most important activity in the in the core of the Viper Lab is focused on transnational and virtual access activities. And here, those infrastructure that I already mentioned um, to be to be shared with the community to ensure um, a transparent process for it, so that. Uh, in combination with the networking activities and the joint research activity that are also present in this infraya project to ensure um, a, a working, a, a well-connected uh, perovskite emerging community. And of course, the, the, the higher goal, especially besides the, per, the, the Viper Lab project, uh, it's also to ensure that our efforts within these three and a half years are supporting the, the larger PV community and uh, ensures a, a transition or help this transition uh, towards the European PV industry. Uh, yeah. Coming back to the transnational and virtual access activity, as I said, we have uh, 13 partners that have these infrastructure shared, and we group them in, in, in three pillars, so to say. You have the listed uh, partners here that are offering infrastructure for processing. Uh, some other partners or also some of the same partners offer uh, characterization infrastructure. And here, these are the infrastructure covering all the, the chain from the material characterization, uh, film processing, finishing the device, analysis, characterization, testing, outdoor testing, or um, aging of the finished devices. And when we say perovskite devices, we we have, as you can see in the in the name of the infrastructure, also for single perovskite um, devices, but also perovskite silicon or silicon perovskite tandems. Uh, and the the last pillar of the infrastructure are the the virtual ones, as I already mentioned. And as a um, a summary of what we managed up to now to do because you know it's um on the paper it looked to us very simple we just we are all connected anyhow these partners in different projects we collaborate anyhow so we will simply open the door of our labs to to more people and so on uh in practical from pragmatic point of view it's not that easy so first of all what ACB, for example, did here, we ensured that we have a platform where these uh, infrastructure are all connected, that one access point that I was showing in this um, yellow uh, scheme. Uh, and these infrastructure um, can be accessed there. So a request can be done. And these requests are um, expected to be both from academia and from industry. So in these almost two years we managed to implement. So we had a higher request, but these are the numbers that were already implemented. So these are the access days that we offered for these three different pillars. And in total, uh, it's almost 400 days out of each 94 days were used by the industry users. Um, that's regarding the transnational access and, um, and virtual access. Next to it, as I said, we have some joint research activities. So in these four different joint research activities uh, that are about materials and device innovation infrastructure, and then advanced device processing infrastructure, and then some other activities on characterization and standardization, and not the least, its environmental and social economic impact. All these different work packages, so in, in, for us, they are work packages led by different partners. We, they are aiming at using the infrastructure that we are having, cross comparing um, how we are simulating materials, how we are innovating uh, the, the architectures, or how are we processing the infrastructure. We're trying in the project also to align some of the architecture, some of the finishing um, processes for the single or the tandem devices. Um, there is um, many activities under the characterization and standardization, the so-called round robins on electrical characterization, optical characterization, or aging, um, complemented by possibly also outdoor characterization. So all these 
uh, activities are cross uh, collaborating in a way and the the idea behind of these joint research activities is to come up with some harmonized and path towards standardization um, activities so this is um, another important part of the um, of the project that is led by AIT um, and here we're trying to uh, practically help the community that we are keep on saying that we want to support with some protocols, with some procedures and uh, some documents. Then, of course, as in every project, we are having the communication dissemination and exchange training. And last but not least is the community building and exploitation, something that we're trying out of these um, activity we're trying to do today. Um, Yes, so this brings me back to the to the scheme of our project and especially to the the yellow, the large PV community uh, block here, because today what we are trying to do with this public event that we're having here is to uh, involve the community and including the industry one into our um, strategic discussions. Uh, in this uh, sense, we already had two um, three-hour workshops with the key stakeholders, and that was last year in September and this year in March. Also on similar dates or close to similar dates, we had other two strategic workshops on harmonized procedures. And today, that's the first our public event with the, with the industry where we try to extend the discussions and yeah. Um, I think that's it, what I wanted to say. This is uh, the first physical meeting that we managed to have in Viper Lab uh, and in uh, behind, um, in the name of all the consortia, I thank you for your attention. I thought we agreed that we are taking some questions or? Uh, afterwards. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Um, okay, please keep your questions uh, to the end of the presentation sessions, uh, so then we can use some synergies in, in the remaining time. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Rutger uh, Skaltman, uh, who is a solar expert from the Helmholtz uh, Centrum Berlin and professor at the HTW Berlin. Uh, at the HZB, uh, he heads the Competence Center for Photovoltaic which successfully brings together solar research and industry. He has been recently elected as the chairman of the European Technology and Innovation Platform for Photovoltaics. It provides independent advice on energy policy issues and the expansion of uh, the photovoltaics uh, in Europe. Yes, Erika. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thanks for, for having me. I presented a very brief uh, summary presentation, but then the, the, the organizers asked me, well, can you expand a little bit more? This was actually my introduction, all of it, but I'll, I'll have a few more details on what this actually means. So on the achievements for proskite technology, I think one and first is the material quality, the unexpected material quality of the proskite material that nobody had seen coming. So this is a real innovation out of the blue, not planned or anything, then the conversion efficiency for the solar cells based on it, upscaling and industrialization, which is the next step to be done, long-term stability, one of the key issues, of course, and in the end, only to be proven over long-term, but hopefully also accelerated. Sustainability profile, which actually, contrary to, to some common belief, is, is actually extremely good for proskites. And I think this is worth stressing here as well. And then opportunities for technology. I think these are the key elements that I wanted to speak about. And then since I had to illustrate a little bit more, and of course I'm perfectly willing to do that, I apologize in advance that these are only examples from our own lab. So this is only from the Helmut Center in Berlin, because this was what I had at hand uh, on very short term. So apologies for not acknowledging the great work that has been done everywhere. And of course, as you probably most of you know, there's 6,000 scientific papers a year on perovskite. So it would have been easy to claim that I represent the, the progress in the field uh, overall. So very quickly then, because I, I don't want to stretch time, as I said, this actually summarizes from the NREL chart on the left, this is efficiency for solar cells. You can see that in the orange line at the bottom, the solar cell efficiency for this new technology, proskite single junction is almost as good as that of silicon, just above it with the laundry record. And 
This is one, and this has spurned a number of companies because it's a thin film, low cost uh, potential technology as spin offs like Evolar and like Saula and many others uh, in Europe, but also, of course, in the UK, uh, in the USA and in China and, and elsewhere. The other attraction, which is, of course, building upon mainstream, is to combine Brovskites with their particular uh, properties with a wide band gap that you can stack on top of silicon and then you can make tandem solar cells. So that's where uh, we uh, have many points on the on the list for, for tandem solar cells from European labs, actually quite a few involving our own lab. But to be fair, the latest record is actually from Kaos in Saudi Arabia. So that's the 33.2% uh, efficiency record, which is so much larger than what you can achieve and achieve with any single junction material, including silicon, that it's attractive to put this as a next generation to continue improving the efficiency of solar cells in it. And the plot on the right is, a, is an adaptation based on the, uh, the Polman paper from a few years ago, where you can actually see that Broskites, for all its mysterical qualities in terms of defects, et cetera, is in the highest class, so to speak, of materials. So along with the three, five uh, semiconductor materials, which are um, also very good. So this is surprising, but it's a fact. So upscaling industrialization, extremely brief. I would like to discuss it, of course, with, with the audience. And as I said, there's many companies looking at industrializing this technology. And there's a good reason for it, uh, uh, because it's a simple material, as you can, well, you cannot really see it on the top left, but it's, it's relatively simple ingredients. In the lab, it's spun, uh, so it's spin coating that you use as a technology for a small area where the record efficiency are achieved in square centimeter. If you go to larger area, you use other wet chemical methods like like slot dye coating as, as illustrated here or inkjet printing or vacuum-based um, co-evaporation as is known for instance also for a long time from uh, CIGS or a hybrid version somewhere in between the two. So this looks without any uh, further detail on it this looks like these methods are all upscalable there's nothing to indicate even though it hasn't been done on a very large scale and certainly not on the gigawatt scale yet there's don't seem to be any major disturbances on the way to scale this up. But of course, it has to be done. And this is hard work, as for instance, many of you in the audience also know. So this is one example. The slide is way too full. I apologize again for this. But slot I quoted from the group of Eva, who actually is the scientific leader of, uh, of the Viper Lab project, where you can see the slot die coating gives you a very high efficiency. And this is certainly an upscalable method. And slot die coating you can do on glass, but of course, you can also do it on a wafer. If, if you want that. So that's just a very brief illustration that it seems that the signs for upscaling are good. Brief message, can't be longer. Long-term stability, it's certainly the key aspect which is not, in my opinion, solved yet completely. There's many, many data points. And of course, with an unripe technology in terms of commercial uh, development, any sample that you put outdoor for a longer time, like we, for instance, did in this case with one tandem, there's many more data points see lots of variations, more variations than you tend to see with silicon alone, even though you see a summer and winter uh, difference there as well. So that's, for instance, the, 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 the higher curves there. But of course, these are samples which are a year old. And for perovskites, or by now they're two years old, actually, for perovskites, this is, this is an ancient solar cell. So whatever you know now on longer term stability is technology from a little bit longer ago. So I'm happy to discuss this in more detail with you, but it's it has to be done. The measurement is not easy, and there's lots of things to be done in the labs to be actually enabled to do this. Oxford PV has actually shown very good outdoor and indoor stability data under accelerated conditions as well. Sustainability profile, as I said, the, the element lead, which is in perovskites, has all, often been mentioned. Oh, there's lead in it. Yes, there is lead in it, and lead is certainly an extremely dangerous material if you swallow it, which you shouldn't. But, uh, and of course, it's easily uptaken by, by plants, et cetera. So it's a material to be taken seriously. But like for many industrial project, uh, products, it can be handled seriously. And the modules are out there somewhere, but they can be taken back, like it's the case for cadmium telluride right now, and as it will be the case for any technology in the future. So anything that you put um, out on the market, you will have to take back again as a producer. But other than that, more importantly, as it is a thin film technology, you need very little material. And one of the key, let's say, relative weaknesses of the silicon technology is that the environmental footprint is very good, but it can be even much better if you use a thin film technology like CIGS, like cadmium telluride, or like perovskite, or like organic. And this is 
if you do all of that, not just carbon footprint, but all of the life cycle analysis elements, and of course the social elements, and as much uh, for now, too much for now. But if you do a digital twin of the process, which we just published, and you can show it, and I showed excerpts from this already at the EU PVSEC more than a year ago. But this is, so don't look at the detail, this is really too much, but we made a digital twin of the silicon process, which is well known, but also of the perovskite process full of assumptions. And if you do that, one of the things you can see is that the energy uh, return on investment, so how much energy do you get back over the lifetime versus how much energy did you put in to start with, the profile is good for any of the technologies, silicon, tandem, and perovskite. And it improves very much so on the x-axis if you start recycling more and more and more. So the more energy you put in initially, like for silicon, the more recycling will help you. If the profile is already very good for thin film technology like perovskite, you see that the line doesn't go up so much. And this actually uh, is also hampered a little bit by present day recycling methods. This morning, for those of you who were there, technology for today is that if you recycle, you burn the encapsulant, which means that you just add additional CO2 into the air, for instance, if you, if you look at the CO2 footprint. But overall, and the tandem, which of course includes silicon, still has a better profile because in the end, it generates more energy because of the higher efficiency of the tandem. So even though, of course, you have silicon and then put something on top, you put initially more energy into making it, but on the balance, because the efficiency is higher, you will get a lower energy input per kilowatt hour generated. So that's why the line for the tandem is above that of silicon. So all in all, there's lots of opportunities for the technology. I gave you a very, 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 very brief snapshot and not even hoping to claim that this representative of the 6,000 papers a year that you get and that anybody has a hard time following. But I think I made marks actually not to be, well, it's recorded, but actually this is a, just a private opinion. So not some uh, say well-documented statement that that is, uh, say, this is like an investor statement that I would say, okay, take this with some care. I think all the signs are green. The long-term stability is certainly, in my opinion, for any of the power market applications, the one which needs most attention and the others need lots of work to be done, but no major obstacles on the road. So I think very good opportunities for the technology to start investing. With that matter, I give back to you. Thank you very much, Rutger, for this really very nice presentation in very short time, but a lot of information. <laughs> um, okay, our uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, Philip Massé, and uh, Philip is the head of strategy and analysis at the Becquerel Institute. For more than seven years, he and his team have been uh, covering all key aspects of solar PV feeding consulting mission and research project with technological, economical, market and regulatory assessment, as well as environmental and social life cycle analysis. Philip has strong exper expertise in a new business model and in all techno-economic issues, both upstream in the value chain, such as BV production cost assessment and downstream on system competitiveness assessment. And he has a double academic background with a master in industrial engineering and management, as well as master in environmental science and management. And Philip is going to give us uh, uh, some insights on the, uh, let's say, forecast, market forecast for uh, for the Pyrrhus Thank you, Philip. Thank you for a kind introduction and uh, just a little clarification. I'm not going to talk about forecasts. I'm going to talk about scenarios, perspectives, potential, but I'm not doing forecasting here. Although we can do it at the Becker Institute. Uh, very briefly, well, you said already many things about what we can do, but the Becker Institute, just uh, uh, to explain to you, is a consulting company. So we also do research projects but we are based uh, the basis. We are a consulting company uh, providing strategic consulting services, and we are specialized in solar PV, assessing many different questions. You heard, uh, you heard it previously. So market questions, economic questions, business model design, but also environmental and social impact uh, analysis. So uh, before touching the. Well, the final numbers, the results of our analysis, I will just uh, uh, walk, through, walk 
I will just uh, present you some, well, basic elements. It was basically already touched in the previous uh, sessions, but why are we talking about market potential for perovskites? Then some methodological elements, very important, because we are you know, looking at something that is very, very far in time. So many, many parameters are underlying the analysis. And then I will go through the, the results and conclude with some key uh, takeaways. So very briefly, what are we talking about the market potential of perovskite? Because potentially, there are many, many advantages. It could be the, well, the silver bullet for the, uh, for the PV market. It could, could reach very high efficiency at a low cost with a low environmental impact, many free-form design possibilities, and many, many also economies in terms of energy consumption. So possibly very, very attractive. But, but we don't know, we don't know what's, what's the potential for this uh, technology on the market. And that's why we came up with, these, uh, with this methodology in five main steps. So first, we had to talk about the market, pot the market potential for photovoltaics without perovskite. So we had to come up with some figures until 2050 for the PV market as a whole. Then we discussed uh, the developments per sub-segment because, of course, uh, a technology depending on its characteristics, doesn't have the same potential for penetration on all sub-segments because the characteristics of each of these sub-segments is uh, much, much different. Then uh, we discussed the, the question of uh, the technology and how it can enter the market at which pace, because we've seen some innovative technologies already coming up on the market in the past. Not all of them have developed at the same pace, it's certainly not all of them have become uh, significant. And then we made some assumptions on these characteristics of perovskites because, of course, we talked about these potential very attractive characteristics, but we are not sure that all of them will deliver. We will maybe end up with having a very high efficient product, but uh, with a low lifetime. And on the other hand, we could have very, very stable products, but with subpar uh, efficiencies. And then in the last part, we, we combined all these elements to, to have an overview of the uh, penetration potential of perovskites. So for the, uh, for the first step on the market, uh, market, fig, market development potential of PV as a whole, so without considering uh, perovskites, we used existing figures. Uh, here we took the, uh, the figures from uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, who, who, and well, Again, they do not forecast, but they say it's possible that by 2050, we could reach a cumulative market of 20 terawatt peak. So we started from there and developed a potential pathway in terms of annual market until that point. Then uh, going to the, uh, the, the de development per segment, we had also to, to, uh, to define some market shares for each segment. As you can see here, uh, what we what we have estimated, simulated at least, is that the ground-mounted PV uh, segment will represent most of the market. Uh, some niche applications should develop as well. You can see here there is agri-PV and floating PV uh, who, has, who have significant market shares. And then the rest of the market is uh, dedicated to uh, rooftop PV applications with BAPV and also BIPV uh, markets. And one point I would like to, uh, to, uh, to, to spend more time on is really the, the assumption of how fast can perovskite penetrate the market. And so if we look at the most recent, I would say, uh, innovation that became significant on the market, it is PERC, we can see that it took approximately eight years for this uh, technology uh, between the, the first time we saw a commercial product on the market and the moment where it uh, finally reached its peak market share, which was in 2021. Uh, I, I don't show it here, but already last year, we saw this uh, market share decrease a bit for PERC as new uh, N-type technologies are, uh, are taking up some, some of their market share. So we assumed uh, eight year lag time for perovskite between the moment it enters the market as a commercial product uh, and the moment it reaches its peak uh, market share on the PV market. And 
the second important assumption we made here is the moment of this uh, market entry. And we assumed that in 2026, we could have already a commercial product. It's a bit ambitious, but um, we, we feel that it's, it should be a goal and it could, could happen if we look at what some, uh, some innovators are working on in Europe. We saw Oxford PV uh, in the previous session, but also, uh, and maybe most importantly, these days in China. Then we defined some uh, scenarios on the characteristics of perovskites. I was saying that we don't know. I mean, we know it has a lot of potential, but we don't know what will happen. So we defined uh, three scenarios. So the first scenario is a scenario where perovskites have, well, high lifetime, so at least on par with what we see on the market. So 30 years uh, theoretical lifetime for the modules or more but a low efficiency, so below what we can see uh, currently uh, for commercial crystalline silicon uh, products. In the second scenario, we take the other extreme. So very high efficiency, higher than crystalline silicon, but quite low lifetime. So we, we, are, we are thinking about 10 years. Well, it's already quite ambitious if we think about what, what perovskites can uh, achieve today, but still it's, it's much, much below what we see uh, on the market. And then in the third scenario, best case scenario, well, perovskites would deliver on all uh, on all these aspects. So high efficiency, high lifetime, and uh, also, of course, uh, attractive costs. And here on the right, you can see uh, what uh, what in term, what it leads to in terms of uh, market capture. So in the first scenario, what we assume is that based on these characteristics, the, the ground-mounted applications are out of reach for perovskites, but some, uh, some market shares in the rooftop market segments could be, uh, could be captured, especially in the BIPV sector where efficiency is less, is less uh, important, but lifetime is extremely, extremely important. On the second scenario, it's more, uh, it's more the opposite. So we see that we, we have very, very limited market capture in the rooftop market, but in the ground-mounted PV segment, we could see some, uh, some uh, development because for some applications, for some type of investor, investors, um, well, limited lifetime is not an issue and efficiency is the most uh, crucial aspect. And on, of course, in the last scenario, if Perovsky deliver on all its promises, it could capture most of uh, all segments. One point I didn't touch, I will be very brief here, but, uh, is that grid-connected applications that I was mentioning are not the only, well, potential market for perovskites. And VIPV, of course, could also be a very attractive uh, market. And here you can find some of the assumptions we made to estimate that, uh, that market potential. So we had to make some assumptions on the penetration of EVs on the market, the penetration of VIPV on the EV market, and also the average area per uh, vehicle that can be uh, that can see the installation of uh, PV cells, but I will come to that in the results section. So results, there you go. So we can see here that in fact, and surprisingly, for the two first scenario, that's not so impressive. You can see on the on the top left that the the market share. Uh, on an annual basis for perovskite wouldn't be that impressive in the first scenario, so around 10% maximum, and below 30% in the second scenario, which would mean uh, a market on an annual basis of 100 gigawatts for the first scenario and 200 or slightly above in the second scenario. On the other hand, in the third scenario, we, of course, would reach much more, much more impressive figures, so we could end up having uh, a market for perovskites of more than 500 gigawatts on an annual basis uh, for the second part of uh, these uh, of these of the first part of the century, and a market penetration, as I was saying, of approximately 90 percent. But in 2050, it would only lead to a cumulative market share of 60 percent, because as I was saying, there is a, a lag time of eight years, and in the end, it is today that things are happening. And perovskites will well, we still come in this scenario early enough 
catch up on the train, but it would still miss some of the of the first year of uh, the booming PV market. And uh, something uh, that I should highlight as well is in scenario two, the market penetration reached on a cumulative basis in the end is not so high because we have this uh, assumption in terms of lifetime. So uh, there would be there would be many many renewal of um, of installations, but also many uh, many competing technologies with a higher lifetime that would capture uh, would capture market share. So the, in the end, the cumulative market share of perovskite would be uh, limited. And on VIPV that I was just mentioning. We can see that the market potentials is also enormous if in the end we have a market for VIPV, but we are quite confident that it will be the case. And we can see here that in the end, the VIPV market would also be around two terawatt peak uh, by 2050. And that pair of skites, even if it does not deliver on all its promises, could be an attractive technology for that market because they're considering the average lifetime of vehicles. Well, lifetime of perovskite wouldn't be such such a problem, but of course it would need to deliver on uh, efficiency. So very briefly, some key takeaways. Uh, I, I talked about grid connected applications and VIPV, but I did not mention because of a, a constraint in time. I didn't talk about IoT market, but that's uh, that's already happening. In fact, that's the the gateway for perovskite commercialization. So that's that's the, the thing that is already ongoing. But when looking at uh, grid-connected applications, as I was saying, perovskites would only reach significant market shares if it delivers on all its uh, promises. At the same time, we saw that if one or the other is not uh, well, is not on par with what we see on the market in terms of market share, it will be insignificant. Although, in terms of absolute figures. It can still be attractive from a business point of view because even if you get 10% of a one terawatt peak market, well, you can reach some uh, significant figures. And another point to 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 keep in mind: so we talked about this lifetime be, be, between first commercialization and the moment it could become uh, significant and reach its peak uh, penetration. We saw that already. Uh, with an assumption on 2026 as a first year of commercialization, we would only reach 60% community market share by 2050. And 2026, as I was saying, is quite optimistic. Uh, in Yesterday, I think there was some ITRPV figures presented, and the first product is likely to be expected, according to them, uh, by 2030. So it already shifts the, 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 first, the first year by, by four years. So in terms of impact, in terms of potential market capture, it would be significant. And so perovskites are very attractive, the potential to reach significant market figures, but it might be it might come too late on the market. So that's something we have to, to also keep in mind on. But no reason to panic because, uh, and that's my point of view, technologies already existing on the market are efficient enough to reach our climate goals. Technology is not a problem. It's more a political will uh, issue. And of course, the VIPV market is extremely attractive, but uh, on, the, on the lead side, this could be, uh, it could be problematic because of, uh, of its toxicity. So this, can, this should also be uh, considered. And that's it. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much for this uh, insightful presentation. Um, our next speaker uh, should have been uh, Professor Ivan Gordon. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he had a little accident, nothing serious, but he could not uh, be with us uh, today. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, he prepared some slides that will be presented by uh, Natalia. But I would uh, still uh, pre uh, introduce uh, uh, Professor Ivan Gordon. Uh, he obtained his PhD in the field of novel magnetic material uh, for sensor application from the University of Leuven, Belgium in 2002. And he started to work in the field of photovoltaic in June 2003 at IMEC. Currently, he's leading the photovoltaic technology and energy system group uh, of IMOMEC. Uh, 
which is an associated lab of both IMEC and Hasselt University. Next to this, he's also part-time professor in digital photovoltaic at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands and editor-in-chief uh, of the international scientific journal Solar Energy Materials and Solar Cells. Since 2016, he's the coordinator of the joint program on photovoltaic of the uh, European Energy Re Research Alliance and a steering committee member of the European Technology and Innovation Platform uh, Photovoltaic. Uh, well, we wish uh, him uh, a soon a recovery soon. And uh, please, Natalia, thank you for uh, volunteering to uh, present his slide. Well, for sure, I won't be able to to give the talk Ivan could give uh, after such an introduction. But um, and this is not the working distance for my eyes to use the slides. However, I'll try to guide you through what. Viper Lab is trying to do towards a strategic research and innovation agenda for perovskite single junction PV. Of course, when we talk about SRIA, it's uh, we always have we all have in mind the um, yeah uh, we all have in mind the already published um, by ATPV and and other association the SRIA document last year. Uh, what ViperLab um, put um, as an additional goal for the perovskite technology was to, of course, because this goes under the, the goal of the project to reinforce the European perovskite um, research and development community. Uh, it's okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, we the, the goal was to, to take this uh, already published uh, SRIA, which is the result of a very... Uh, large effort and to focus on a single junction perovskite PV module. Uh, as you all know, in the area, uh, I can. Uh, he's talking. I, I think I'll try to survive. Yeah, I already excuse myself. So, uh, okay. So to you know that in the in the um, strategic and research innovation agenda, all the technologies are covered. And uh, but here the focus for Viper Lab will be to to stay with the single junction perovskite. And the starting point of this um, the the published SRIA uh, document is. Um, is made by the listed here, um, ATPV, ERA PV, and covering all these technology, as I mentioned. But this document is yet important because um, for three different reasons. First of all, it's a guidance for the uh, photovoltaic uh, research and development um, stakeholders to align their goals and, and priorities. Second of all, is a guidelines for the European and national funding uh, bodies uh, to, to fund the, the right topics. Uh, and thirdly, uh, to, to make the general public uh, aware about the challenges and the, about the opportunities of these uh, technology. Um, yes, so as uh, I mentioned, the, the starting point for the so-called Viper Lab SRIA uh, or the Viper Lab version of the SRIA was the, um, was the, the European uh, Strategic Research Innovation Agenda. And as a basis for the modification or for the adjustment of this agenda, we used the two already organized workshops that I also mentioned in my talk. That's the one held in September uh, as a side event of the European PVSEC. And the second uh, was in March this year as a side or uh, as a side event of the energy conversion and storage days. So based or at the end of these workshops, there were several questions that were addressed in the discussions with the with the research and um, other uh, stakeholders. So these are the questions here. I can read them. So do we agree with the vision of the KPIs, the key performance indicators from the SRIA document uh, for from the European SRIA? Uh, do we agree with the activities that are mentioned there? And what about the, the research activities that are missing in that document? And what should be the main um, priorities uh, for the timeline uh, of the upcoming years? 
So these discussions and the raised questions were considered and are uh, taken into account for the Viper Lab um, 3 a document. And here is the um, short list of the discussed key performance indicators. And those were regarding the LCOE, and uh, regarding the carbon footprint and the manufacturing. So these are the original um, the targets for these three KPIs in the European and a SRIA document, and then discussing these key performance indicators during those two workshops, um, there are some concerns or some, some, some statements that uh, came up. So the first one is that more emphasis is needed to on commercial available uh, perovskite modules um, that have been produced in Europe. So that produced in Europe should be considered to be included in the Viperlab SRIA document. Uh, and then regarding the carbon footprint was considered one of the main dif um, differentiators uh, compared to, uh, to the traditional silicon uh, uh, PV. And third one was regarding the LCOE target. And here the, 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 the statement was that this was found to be unrealistic because of the... Um, the too high requirement regarding the large scale production of the perovskite modules. So considering these discussions and um, proposals to modify the KPI's target from the European SRIA, this is the, 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 the KPI targets that are planned to be included in the Viper Lab strategic research innovation activity. So as you can see, some of them are remained as, as uh, initially um, found in the SRIA, but some the regarding the manufacturing, for example, or the regarding the um, LCOE um, will be will be modified as listed here in, in red colors. Uh, yeah, and this is this brings me to to the summary um, of Ivan's presentation. And so, the Viper Lab project is preparing a strategic research and innovation agenda for single junction perovskite photovoltaics, which is of course based on the European one uh, published last year, with a focus on single junction perovskites. And via yeah, the workshops that we were organizing, um, and after the discussions that were held, some um, points are considered to be covered there. And this is about the updated KPIs by 2030, about the prioritization of the activities that are needed and the drafting of a clear timeline and roadmap to obtain these KPIs. Um, I think that's it. So the document that was planned to, to be made by ViperLab is coming in the upcoming months. Uh, and with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Natalia. Um, we are just on time, uh, but maybe we can have a, a few questions. I'm sure that uh, we will have a lot of questions from uh, from the audience, but maybe we can take uh, a couple of questions, two, three questions uh, from the audience. If uh, uh, let's say before we move to the to the next uh, panel session. Yes. Um, hi, so I'm Ivona from Helmholtz Centrum Berlin. I actually had a question regarding the models that the Becquerel Institute did. So about the eight-year timeline penetration into the market, you made that assumption based on how long it took for TopCon, right? Did I get that correctly? Um, for so perk. For perk, perk, sorry, yes. And you're assuming that this would apply for perovskite, but don't you think that this is a little bit a different scenario because we already had an existing silicon industry so to say so then it was just changing the wafer while like for perovskites we are kind of starting from scratch so i would say just copy pasting this timeline might be an under underestimation and to disregard everything else that is there about perovskite yes i think it's optimistic so yeah. it could be so worse. So have you looked into other timelines? What would happen then, or best case, worst case scenario, and things like no, that? No, we we didn't do that, but we could do it. But it would be the same story as for the as for shifting the 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 date of entry. It would just worsen the case of of perovskites. But yeah, we we could do it certainly. But I I couldn't tell you by how much it would impact the the mm -hmm. figures because we didn't do the exercise. But that would certainly be useful. 
but if you have to give a less optimistic uh, time, what would you say it would be if it's not eight years? I think at some point we we thought about having you know well testing different uh, time gaps. I would say, and we were hesitating between eight, twelve, and fourteen. I guess, and I, I thought in the end. Uh, our decision was based on the fact that otherwise the figures would be maybe too bad and we don't want to to give a, a you know a, a too gloomy uh too gloomy uh, vision on the on the potential of perovskites so yeah eight years possibly uh, a best case scenario if you can if you can say yeah say that okay thank you yeah please uh, Luc Borvecchio from uh, NG. Um, in the, in the Becquerel study, which kind of perovskite are you considering? It's a, a single junction, several long junction of perovskite, or perovskite with silicon? It's it's not clear for me. Thank you. Well, we asked ourselves that question also at the beginning, and then if you think about it in step four, where we define the scenarios, we are basically mixing a bit everything, and we we are not looking at the intrinsic characteristics of perovskite but mostly how it compares to to uh, the other technology well basically crystalline silicon and so if we think about the best case scenario so the the one scenario three where all promises you know are hold so like uh, higher lifetime higher efficiency we can assume it's tandem although we don't we don't say it but basically that's what that's what we can assume on the other hand if we think about uh, lower efficiency higher lifetime we have well more possibilities there but more likely it will be single junctions we don't we don't talk about it because we don't want to we didn't want to to lose ourselves if i can, if I can say so into too many technological details because otherwise we, we never stop you know because even if we talk about tandem are we talking about 2t 40 uh what kind of manufacturing process i mean it's a never-ending story so we we try to say more pragmatic, I would say. Thank you. Any other questions? Maybe just a small question uh, to Rutger and uh, Natalia uh, concerning the uh, cell that uh, you had really uh, world record at the end of 2022. Uh, can you share information a little bit about the size, for instance, and some any useful information? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the size was one square centimeter. Uh, as always for these record cells, we don't want to make them smaller because I think it's very difficult to get any useful uh, information. But square centimeter is still very small, and uh, uh, it was based on a heterojunction silicon bottom cell adapted for for use in the tandem, so for extra infrared response and. Um, the top cell had a few adaptations. So this is really still about the, the detailed engineering of the device in this case. So it's really modifying the individual interfaces in the stack of layers that const constitute the solar cell on top of the silicon. And um, yeah, I think any day now you can read the science paper that is uh, now accepted and will probably be published uh, um, one of these days. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, maybe we can move to the panel uh, sessions. Uh, there's a question online. Yes, indeed. Uh, can you elaborate on the reasoning in scenario number two that uh, ground mount PV market will be more accepting of high efficiency with short lifetime than low efficiency with long lifetimes? Is it? Yeah, I, I I get the question. Well, it's more like uh, the objectives on this market segments are, are different. It's more, uh, well, PV is more considered as a financial asset. So once it's paid back, once the returned, expected return is reached, uh, and for example, a feed-in tariff or a PPA has reached uh, its termination, well, you can think about uh, revamping, repowering, uh, using the land for maybe installing more efficient modules and selling the, the, the other modules on the secondhand market or sending them to 
uh, to recycling um, if they are not producing enough anymore. So it's really about uh, if the, the reasoning is that if we have very high efficient market, but that degrade very fast, but that still uh, gives opportunity for financial return, we feel that there is a market for that and it's on the ground mounted uh, side. Okay, thank you very much. Then, uh, well, big applause for the presenters. And then uh, I would like to ask the panelists uh, to uh, join me here on the, on the, on the, on the uh, yes. So I will uh, call for Mr. Uh, Jacek Turinski, uh, Dr. Tony Sample, Dr. Johan Lindahl and Rüger with us and uh, Dr. Stefan uh, Abermann. Okay, welcome uh, gentlemen. I will uh, just start a little introduction uh, with uh, my guest here. Um, Mr. Uh, Jacek uh, Trusinski um, uh, is a deputy head for a green and circular economy within the Directorate General for Internal Market and Industry of the European Commission. Uh, prior to that, he has worked uh, on investment support scheme with, within the Economic and Financial Affairs Directorate General and on regulatory matter linked to energy efficiency and renewable within the Energy Directorate General of the Commission. Before joining the commission, uh, Jacek worked as a consultant on energy matters to various uh, industry association. Welcome, Jacek. Uh, then the uh, next uh, guest is uh, Dr. Tony Sample, uh, is a senior research at the GRC uh, European Solar Test Installation, where he has been working for over 20 years. Uh, his fields of interest cover PV model testing, uh, precision calibration of PV model and standard development. He's currently the convener of the IEC TC82 uh, Working Group 2 and Senelec uh, TC82 Working Group 1, which produce international standards for PV models. Okay, uh, the third guest is Dr. Uh, Johan Lindahl. Uh, Johan has extensive experience of market and regulatory topics uh, concerning the PV market, both from his uh, current law role as the Secretary General, Secretary General of the European Solar Manufacturing Council, but also as a Swedish representative in the international organization uh, IEA uh, PVPS for 10 years, and his previous role as the Swedish PV Industry Association spokesperson. Uh, John also holds a PhD in thin film solar cells and uh, the type uh, CIGS from Uppsala University, uh, Sweden. Welcome. Uh, um, Professor R uh, Rutger, uh, we already presented. And then uh, also I have here uh, with us uh, Dr. Stefan Abermann. Um, who received uh, his PhD from the Vienna University of Technology, Faculty of uh, Electrical Engineering and Information Technology in 2007. Um, he was a university assistant at the Vienna University of Technology until 2010, when he joined the Austrian Institute of Technology as a staff scientist uh, and remained until 2013. Uh, he has uh, he was appointed uh, as the head of new technology scouting uh, at the Austrian uh, Institute of Technology uh, uh, until 2015 before joining uh, Schwartz and partner as a patent attorney trainee and later as European patent attorney. And since January 2019, he's uh, uh, the head of the competence unit energy conversion and hydrogen at uh, the Austrian Institute of Technology. Welcome, uh, gentlemen. And uh, I will. Uh, I would like to start this panel uh, discussion with uh, you, uh, Jacek. Um, the European Commission has launched in 2022 uh, the European Solar PV Industry Alliance to accelerate solar PV development in the EU, facilitating investment, uh, the risking sector acceleration, and supporting uh, Europe's decarbonization target. Uh, could you please give us more information about this alliance and the situation of the progress so far? Thank you. 
Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks for the question and thanks for your invitation. So indeed, I mean, we, the Commission member states, uh, we have a plan now uh, to bring the solar industry back to Europe. Uh, the, the background is, of course, you know, what happened with Ukraine, where we realized that we should not uh, depend for any energy uh, source or vectors on concentrated supply. Uh, the background is also what happened with the IRA. Uh, in the US, where we saw that uh, uh, the power of subsidies and a lot of our remaining uh, industry now considering or actually going uh, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic to make their investments. And so in that context, in December uh, of last year, we have proposed uh, to uh, set up this industry alliance together with key partners such as EIT in Energy, uh, uh, the European Solar Manufacturing Council and Solar Power Europe. And the aim is to scale up uh, production of solar PV in Europe. The target is 30 gigawatts by 2025. So it's a very ambitious target because it applies to all parts of the supply chain, not only modules, but also wafers, ingots, and so on. And, you know, the main tool to, to achieve that will be industry cooperation and support for project developers to find financing. And such alliances in the future have proved to be uh, very effective. For batteries, we have managed to mobilize more than 130 billion of uh, investments over four years. But, you know, in the context of the IRA and the cost efficiency of Chinese production, this is not enough. And so there's more than just the alliance. In March, we have tabled a major legislative proposal, which is called the Net Zero Industry Act, which aims to set up a comprehensive uh, framework that will support such investments related to procurement, innovation support through so-called regulatory sandboxes, uh, faster permitting for project development, access to finance. And, and finance is the last element I wanted to, to mention. We do a lot, of course, IRA, 400 billion euros of new money, uh, dollars, new money, we don't have that, but we have a lot of resources at the EU level. We have the innovation fund, we have the recovery funds, we have the EIB investments, and we act on all of these fronts uh, to enable to a greater extent support to commercialization, not only research uh, support uh, for uh, solar PV. So we hope that we will start to see results of th this soon, although, of course, the international context is difficult. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, may, maybe just like uh, how this in, in initiative could support emerging uh, community and business such as the Perovskite PV. I mean, can you provide some really like concrete insight on how this initiative could, could support such emerging communities? Right. So the, the, the above all, the, the, the primary uh, objective is to quickly scale up production. But in the long term, we cannot be competitive without innovation. So research and innovation will be part of that uh, alliance. Uh, we are still open to having a dedicating, dedicated working group as part of the alliance. That would not, notably, I think what would really help is to identify options for long-term commercialization. And in that context, impact uh, future uh, uh, support programs aimed both at, at uh, early TRLs and then uh, more like uh, first of a kind demonstration. So you start with, with Horizon, then you move to the Innovation Fund, then state aid from member states. So you know to 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 have it throughout the 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 the, the chain, including the famous Valley of Death. So I think that there there would be a clear added value of the alliance. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um... I will move now to uh, Professor Rutger. Uh, so you have shown a remarkable progress of pyroviscite solar cells and rapid increase in their efficiency in relatively short time. Uh, however, as we all know, bringing a technology from the lab to the production scale entails debugging many technical issues. In your opinion as an expert, what are the most important technical barriers that still need to be removed to have pyroviscite-based solar cell ready for industrialization. Thanks for the question. I think also connecting to, uh, to the previous speaker, I think it's very important for the European supply chain to have very high quality silicon-based um, production first, because you can only build tandems if you have the silicon bottom. So I think it's very important. And this kind of billion plus euro investments that you need are certainly not going to be done in a technology with the, with the readiness level of Provskites alone. I think 
these will move in and over time, but a little bit later. I think that's that's very important. It's also one of the conclusions from the uh, ETIP PV conference that we had in the past uh, two days as one of the main points. And there's lots of innovation to be done on that side. But to come back to your question, the um, as I indicated in my brief introduction, uh, I think the efficiency gap between the records on silicon and tandems are large enough to, to step into to say, and this is what we hear from our industrial partners. And actually, many, many, many of the silicon based producers have tandem on the roadmap. And also, many of them have come by, not just by us, but any of the European uh, institutes who are good at making tandems. And what they want to know is, especially, is stability good enough? And what are the critical steps that, uh, that you see in upscaling? And in some cases, like in uh, Pepperoni, a European backed. Um, uh, Horizon Europe pilot line program, so quite a large piloting activity already, backed or flanked by inf serious investments by, in this case, QCells as a lead um, module producer who is leading that consortium together with us. There you can see, well, there's some elements, it's too much detail probably now, where you say, for now in a record cell, you have certain elements that you will not want to have in production because they're too slow or they're too uh, expensive or uh, that doesn't seem to be a real reason. Uh, to take one example, the top electrode for a tandem has to be made. And if you do that by the standard methods, which you know for upscaling, you need to put a little layer in between just to protect what, whatever is underneath. This is something you don't want to have because this little protective layer, it's a tin oxide layer made by ALD, for those of you who know uh, their, their details. This is a very slow process. You don't really want to have it. So this is the kind of thing where you debottleneck. One of the materials is C60. That's a material where I think this is unattractive to have. So what we do in our research labs is then how much do we lose of the record efficiency if we take it out? Can we take it out? What happens? And on the other hand, the companies will then see, can we make it fast enough or big enough? And the same actually goes for the collaboration that we have with Avancis, where you can see you can use the CIGS just as well for bottom cell, and then you have to solve different problems. And then for all across the board, single junction or, or tandem, you'll want to make sure what are intrinsic instabilities that there may be in the proskite and what are extrinsic. So what can you just keep out if you have a glass glass laminate and you you glue it well on the sides and you keep out all the water. What is then still left of, um, of instabilities and how can you prevent those by making each of the little individual steps better? So I think those are a few of the elements that we work on. So get rid of the unscalable parts or the very slow or expensive parts uh, while keeping up the efficiency to as much as you can. And then changing the device stack a little bit for, and you can offer some efficiency for stability. Uh, without going into the details of, uh, of Philip's uh, detailed uh, analysis, you want to have 20 plus years if you want to go for tandem. I think you don't want to go for a bankable product so easily if, it's, if you're in the silicon business and you put something on top, you don't want to change your business model and go for say lower life and a completely different client base, etc. So this is, has to be solved and I'm optimistic that it will be, but it has to be shown still. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next uh, question is uh, to uh, Tony. Um, so as a well-recognized standardization expert in the PV field, uh, could you please give us some insight on what would be needed for an emerging technology such as, such as pyroviscite to get ready for industrial deployment in terms of maturity testing and qualification standards? Okay, so... For perovskites, you can divide these, first of all, for single junction and tandem. They may have different characteristics. You may have different stability criteria for each. So the first universal point will be everybody needs to measure them. So currently, perovskites are often measured using constant solar simulators. It's quite a long technique. We need to have something which can be scaled up to be used in an industrial process on a faster process, be LED-based, potentially even flash-based solar simulators, such that your throughput in a factory can be measured in a short time, but labeled accurately, because ultimately the clients want to know exactly what is going to be produced by these uh, 
uh, modules ultimately bought. So the first part is a characterization of these devices. The second is lifetime and uh, type approval. The 61215 type approval test, which is routinely used for industry, is based on a silicon reliability model and a reliability program which was instigated by uh, JPL back in the days when we had production uh, runs of kilowatts, not megawatts, and certainly not terawatts. And the issues regarding perovskite and perovskite on silicon is, firstly, are there any ad adaptions to that qualification process which needs to be made to take into account the intrinsic nature of perovskites? But the second and really important one, and the biggest unknown is, are there any unknown failure modes which occur intrinsically because of perovskites, which this accelerated test program will not bring out? And the only way really to figure that out is to have these materials in the field for a long enough period of time, you actually get to see, are there any other failure modes which are not being accelerated by this uh, initial stress testing? And unfortunately, that just takes time. But actually, I mean, even when testing and qualification according to a certain uh, standard have been achieved, uh, in your opinion, what are the main phases that an emerging technology would pass through to be accepted by the mass market? Um, again, it comes back to time because we, we've seen it even for uh, conventional crystalline uh, technologies when we've either introduced novel materials or new processes, we could come and have a failure mode which wasn't expected. We had PID come out when we changed the anti-reflective coating. We had AAA backsheet failures when everybody assumed that the backsheet was perfectly fine. These failures only occurred some years in the field. And afterwards, everybody was very good at quickly developing new tests to say, oh, yes, once you run through this new test, you can see that there's a failure there. The difficulty is going to be for anything perovskite-based is getting over that initial period of investment needing to get your production up to volumes required whilst being able to sell that into the market where people will be risk averse and say well either you've got to offer me a very good product at a much cheaper price otherwise i won't take the risk and it's getting over that initial process that might be difficult which i think will be an advantage for building this technology on top of existing PV producers. The, the, the big Chinese manufacturers are already interested in doing this. Mm -hmm. The idea that we could somehow in Europe just develop a brand new gigawatt factory based on perovskite tandems is just nonsense. This is going to be based on people using their existing knowledge and developing it then for perovskite tandems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, now I will uh, go to uh, to uh, Stefan. Um, well, it's similar subject, but uh, a little bit more, uh, let's say, in details. You have been involved in different workshops to collect insights related to the measurement and aging from researcher working on uh, pyroviscite solar cells. Could you please give us an overview on the challenges faced by researchers in terms of harmonized measurement or convergence, divergence of aging tests, and main progress on those fields? So, um, yeah, I think from the from the commercial uh, perspective, it has been already answered by Tony more or less. But maybe to to uh, answer the question from a scientific perspective, or also from the perspective what what we saw or what we see in the Wipel project. I think, in my opinion, the, the biggest challenge is still the, the large variety of, of different materials, which is a nice thing. Yeah, it has been shown by Professor Schleipmann that this is it's quite democratic. You, you just need kind of a, a spin coater and you need to be a chemist and then you can do a photovoltaics. That's a great thing. On the other hand, it, 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 uh, it, it opens up the field for different approaches. And uh, just to, to explain what I mean, in my opinion, the reason why silicon was so successful, I mean, we all here know that it's not the perfect material in terms of, of energy conversion. 
if you're talking on the physical parameters, if you're talking of the energy needs for the fabrication of the material needs, if you're talking about weight, if you're talking about flexibility, so many, many, many disadvantages. Still, it's nine, it's above 95% of the production. Why? Because it has been heavily developed since the 1960s from CMOS technology, and everything was there already, even though not optimized for photovoltaics, but a highly reliable large volume value chain. And reliability, in my opinion, it's much more important than efficiency. Of course, researchers want to have efficiency because then they get their point on the annual chart. But at the end, it's reliability because that's what we trust and that's why uh, why the people buy a product. And and uh, so at, what I, where I want to go is, so on silicon, it's silicon, the preservation is silicon oxide. And for the, for the contacts, you use doped silicon. Um, so that's one material. So it's and then coming to harmonization. It's very easy to harmonize in addition or even more because the process, uh, the, the processing possibilities are quite restricted. So you, you, you have always more or less the same processes, um, which is also much more diverse in perovskite. And this makes it so difficult to, to harmonize the things that's, that's, so when I started in the Wiper Lab, this, 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 the work package on the harmonization, I was quite ambitious. I thought we have three to four years, we do this, and then we, we, give, the, we give the data to the standardization committees, and then we're done. We just started. So, and, and uh, not only that we need much, much more time also for the commercial, commercialization, but it's even difficult only to harmonize within this group of research institutes, because if we want to harmonize just the IV measurement, we saw we need first need to see uh, everyone is using a different device, a different device concept, different contact, different ceiling, different sizes. So uh, there is really, really, really a lot of challenges to be tackled. And and uh, since I have we have a colleague from the commission, not the right one, but I think for the for the uh, in terms of funding perspective, we for for such a thing, we need a much more longer sustainable funding. Because if the project ends, uh, that we may start from zero again in some other project. And for, for such a thing, we are talking about collaborative development, which is the main idea of WiperLab, to bring to accelerate development by collaboration. We need really long term sustainable funding to bring the things forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, now I will come to uh, Johan. Um, I kept the difficult question to you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, 15 years ago, a large part of the value chain for manufacturing silicon-based solar cells was still in Europe. However, a decade ago, Europe lost this manufacturing value chain. Uh, how do you see the future production of new solar models based on emerging technologies such as uh, pyroviscite-based solar cell in Europe? And how to avoid the pitfalls we had with the silicon-based solar industry and models 10 years ago? Yeah, I, I gave this uh, question a lot of thought, but if I may start from the end of the question, how do, if, if like, how do we avoid losing an industry if we manage to build it up again? And I think a major difference uh, between now and then is that now, Everyone agrees, or almost everyone, but even conservative uh, stakeholders like EIA and IPCC, et cetera, everyone points towards that PV will be the major power source in the world in the quite near future. So it plays a much bigger role in a geopolitical or even in, in society, a bigger role in society than it did 10, 15 years ago, which means as I perceive it, is that if we manage to reestablish a PV manufacturing industry in, in Europe, the sort of geopolitical forces behind will not allow us to lose it again. Because when PV now is becoming the new oil, we can see that by US uh, putting IRA in place. We can see it in India putting import tariffs. Uh, China has been subsidizing their PV uh, manufacturing industry for a decade. It has become of a geopolitical importance. And if we manage to bring back PV manufacturing in Europe, I don't think that policymakers, et cetera, would like to, would 
sort of accept losing that geopolitical importance again, so to say. So that's the sort of, uh, it, PV has become too important to, to lose an industry if we manage to build it up again. But the first part of the question, how is important this is like new technology like Periscite or Tandem. And in an idle, e, e, idle world, uh, one could sort of go to the famous quote of uh, Wayne Gretzky. If you want to be the best in ice hockey, don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where the puck will be. However, uh, if you sort of miss and, and skate to where you think the puck will be and it's not there, you will look, look like a fool. And currently, Europe is not is a bad player when it comes to manufacturing. So I think we need to skate where the puck is at the moment first and then move toward the, where the uh, puck will be. So I agree with the gentleman beforehand that I think that even if... if uh, myself and many seeing the roadmaps and see that uh, tandem cells will be the future uh, we m might need to first establish the silicon production so we can make tandems in europe so i agree with that even if if uh, I, and i believe that like like most have pointed out that tandem cells will be the next things but i don't think we can afford in europe to just go there directly uh, it, we might miss the pipe puck completely basically so so a little bit uh, fluffy answer but I, I hope you i made sort of an illustration of how i see on, on on the problem sure sure but do you think a, uh, i mean regulation could support uh, let's say a stronger pv production chain in europe like produced in europe subsidized in europe or vice yeah. versa yes absolutely um but one i think one wants understand what's happening on global wise and i think europe has taken the first steps there that in an ideal world, we would have a fair competition between regions, et cetera, and, and then those that are best will, will succeed establishing an, an industry. But as I said, PV will become the biggest power source in the world, uh, the most important power source, and the superpowers in the world won't just sort of uh, go for the ideal way. They will try to secure this industry. And they do it by subsidies or import tariffs, as we see now. And we in Europe can either say, well, we would like to do it another way, but if we don't play, play along this game, we will lose because the other ones will use whatever they can to, to have secure of PV manufacturing. So what Europe has done now is, is taking the first steps, I think, by, by opening up the state aid rules, make it, uh, allow member state to support and give subsidies to PV manufacturing. It's now an open question which member states will take this opportunity to create uh, industries uh, for the future and this, yeah, um, bring back jobs, etc. Um, that's will hopefully we have some answers in, in a few months from now and a half a year. But I think we need to have a mindset that PV manufacturing will be highly influenced by the political will to have a control of it on a global level from now on. And we can't just say, let's have a fair game in between, but it, because there will be countries that don't play fair to establish subsidies, et cetera, to have control of it because it will play such a major role in, in, in society and in, in the energy system. Coming to that, uh, and all the things that, um, uh, that you mentioned, that we have certain things in, in place, so we have the horizon for the research. We have we have the innovation fund for the most sort of innovative new technologies to be established. Uh, we are now sort of setting in in place the framework for possibilities to scale up by by allowing direct subsidies, etc. But one policy instrument that that uh, I think was missing in this chain is the IPSI, because I think the IPSI. Uh, uh, sort of framework comes in between the innovation fund and direct subsidies for, for large scale. Um, from the, uh, the European Solar Manufacturing Council, we launched a uh, PV IPSA initiative, um, uh, I think basically two, one and a half year ago. Currently, it's a put a, a little bit on ice, not because we don't believe in it and, and don't, uh, we still think it's an important uh, tool to have for the future to bridge this value of death. 
Um, but we see currently that both maybe the commission, but also especially member states have their hand full of coping in implementing the, the new regulation without, within the TCTF, the Net Zero Industry uh, Act, uh, but also sort of uh, update their recovery resilience plan, everything that's going on right now. Uh, we had a, a country, Spain, that was interested in leading the process from the member states, but the things we got from them that they, they have too much to do with other regulation coming out from EU. So the IPSA, uh, PV IPSA initiative that we initiated, I put a little bit on ice uh, due to these reasons, not that we don't think it's important, but that's another tool in toolbox, which I think can be important for Paris guides from to be in between the sort of innovation fund and the direct volume um, uh, or the measures that are directed for creating volume in production, uh, so to say. Thank you very much for this uh, elaborated answer. Um, I have too many questions still, but uh, from time point of view, I think we are uh, arriving to almost the end of, uh, of this, uh, let's say, workshop. Uh, however, maybe I would like to give, uh, um, let's say, uh, some time for questions from the audience, if there are any questions, because this is a kind of workshop. I'm sure that many of you still have question in mind. Okay, Natalia, you can just push the button. Thank you. I would like to come back to a comment that uh, Stefan mentioned regarding these uh, activities towards harmonization and standardization procedures that take longer than a common research project or even an infrastructure project. But uh, maybe a comment from the other side of the of the platform from the Euro European um, government or I don't know. Uh, these um, the um, platforms for collaborations and so on. How do you see these? Are there other tools or other platforms to support such activities uh, for longer than uh, normal projects? <laughs> I'm looking at you because I expect you. you maybe you might you might know more than, than think, the others. Um, well, for me, standardization is one thing. Yeah, and uh, financing is another. Uh, standards are essential. The Commission has recently tabled a strategy for standardization, which aims to identify those standards, future standards that are central for our policy objectives, and uh, accordingly put pressure on SENS and ELEC to prioritize those standards over other standards. So if you as a community have certain ideas on standards that can really help, notably the competitiveness of the solar PV industry in Europe, by all means, let us know, and we will try to make sure that this is accelerated. Uh, we also, by the way, work on eco-design standards, so mandatory requirements for all products placed on the market for solar PV, linked notably to, to their um, carbon footprint, durability, and so on. So that, that's also part of the picture. For financing, point taken, I, I don't have anything, any special insights as to future plans to uh, support research projects over a longer period than previously. What I know is that the change that is happening indeed is that we are not only focusing on basic research, but really increasingly focusing on making sure that this basic research is then translated into commercial opportunities with first-of-a-kind demonstration projects. Any more questions? In terms of standardization, it's going to sound brutal, but standards are written by those who turn up. And unless your particular uh, perovskite based tandems or even uh, single junction turn up to the standardization activities, those who are in the committees will not write your standards for you. And IEC in particular is aimed at facilitating uh, tariff-free trade. So again, unless there's a market there, we don't see the need to be writing standards. 
we've tried to preempt that because we can see that this is going to develop. So we're already looking at how to uh, give initial technical reports on how to measure these devices. But in terms of how to then go to lifetime assessment type approval, uh, I'm just asking around all the test labs who are part of the IEC standardization process, have they actually seen these devices yet? And the majority either say no or yes, but we can't talk about it because they're all under NDAs. So until these actually start being produced and can be readily bought and sold such that everybody can start testing them, we can't start to gather the data relevant to write the appropriate standards. So again, to all the manufacturers out there, start talking with the test labs, start handing some of these out, as well as getting them in the field, because ultimately you're going to have the situation which happened with uh, SIGs and CAD Telluride when they started to be sold, is there was no technology-specific standard ready for them at that point. The result of which they used the crystalline silicon tests now, some of those were perfectly acceptable, but others needed then ultimately to be modified. And it's that modification which I think will be required for the perovskite-based materials and how much modification is still to be seen because we haven't got our hands on the material yet. But Tony, uh, just a question regarding this one. I mean, do we need really to align on one, uh, let's say, standard? Of course, we are taking the silicon-based solar cell as the highest standard. And this is true, this technology is valid for 30 years lifetime. But now, for instance, we are facing repowering, uh, which um, after 10 years, this technology becomes like good for re repowering because the technology is advancing very much. And then uh, when we were also talking about the different market penetration of Pirovescite, I mean, now you, it seems like we have also different market, like you have plug-in PV, you have the EV market you have, and those have completely different standard and expectation. So do we need still to focus on the highest standard possible 30 years lifetime, and then wait till we achieve it before we put those material into, into market? Or shall we rethink how standardization should be done on the different emerging market that can probably accept very uh, well uh, technology with a uh, much uh, uh, smaller uh, shorter lifetime? Ultimately, the market will decide. Uh, if you have a variation of products you can choose to, to uh, give you your power, either it's a utility scale system or if it's on a, uh, an EV or if it's an Internet of Things uh, device, the customer will always have a choice that he could go for a traditional technology, he could go for a, a more innovative technology, and they will make that balance of risk reward at that time. And the more we can help them in terms of giving them confidence in the technology, the better they'll be able to make that choice. Uh, but until we have this material, until we start testing, we don't know. Will we likely need a 30-year lifetime? Probably, because ultimately these are going to be used in multi-megawatt systems as well as large industrial systems. And they will, at the moment, the repowering part of the equation is a financial uh, question, not a technological one. Uh, it's usually related to uh, power purchase agreements that have come to the end or feeding tariffs which come to the end. And if they get new uh, requirements, they can make a a greater financial return. It's not a technological issue for that. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think we are about 10 minutes uh, beyond uh, the, 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 the exact timing. So I would like to thank you very much. Thank the speaker and the panelists uh, again for, uh, for being here and for all this insightful uh, uh, discussion and ideas. Uh, and I would ask you a very big applause for uh, for uh, for this uh, for our speakers and panelists today. Thank you very much.